showcase where story meets policy. My name is Angelica Santiago Gonzalez, a third year student, uh, MSW MSP at the Brown School. And I'm pretty sure this is the last year. So <laughs> uh, I'm also the graduate policy scholar student ambassador. And I am so excited for the event today and the presenters. And this also would not be possible at all with Fiona, without Fiona Namatovu and Becca Smith Grantham, as well as Jesse Clark, who helped make this event happen. That being said, thank you so much for the incoming Brown School students that have jumped on this and are eager to learn uh, and eager to also meet the graduate policy scholars and learn a little bit more about it. And with that, I'm going to also introduce Dan Ferris and Atia Thurman, who are part of the amazing group of advisors who lead the Graduate Policy Scholar Program. Thank you. Good evening. Dan, I think it's you first, right? <laughs> Fantastic. So, Hello everyone, I'm Dan Ferris, I use he him pronouns. Uh, I'm the Faculty Director of Training and Education Initiatives at the Social Policy Institute, uh, as well as faculty at the Brown School. Uh, it is my pleasure and privilege to welcome you here to say a huge thank you and congratulations to our scholars uh, who you'll hear from tonight. Angelica in particular as our graduate ambassador uh, and, and MSP graduate assistant has done incredible work during her time at the Brown School uh, to lift up the stories of the students who are policy passionate. So thank you to her and the coordinating committee. Um, as Angelica mentioned uh, tonight's program, the theme is where story meets policy. And as we like to say at the Brown School, um, effective policy practice happens at the seamless intersection of rigorous research, data and evidence uh, with storytelling. And so we'll be getting to hear from a number of different student voices uh, representing multiple schools and programs across campus tonight. Uh, so Graduate Policy Scholars is available to all graduate students across WashU. Um, and uh, if you're interested to learn more, uh, please do follow the Clark Fox Policy Institute and Social Policy Institute uh, who helped to make the program possible uh, for updates as we expect to uh, put out an invitation for applications for our next exciting cohort uh, beginning this summer. So thanks again for being here and I'll turn it over to Atia. Thank you so much, Dan. It's, I'm really excited to be here. This is the first time. So we're starting new traditions all the time and that excites me. And um, it, it's really just a fantastic way to share what our graduate policy scholars are doing. It's just a little bit of history to orient you. Graduate Policy Scholars Program is still really relatively new. It has its origins with the Clark Fox Policy Institute. And the Clark Fox Policy Institute was established by the Brown School at Washington University in St. Louis. It's the Maxine Clark and Bob Fox Policy Institute, and it's the Center for Public Policy Engagement. Our mission is to advance social and economic justice by working collaboratively to connect evidence-based policy solutions to public awareness, practitioner training, and policy decision-making. So following the election of 2016, and so just so you know, the Policy Institute launched in 2017, I'm um, sorry, 2015. So following the election in 2016, there was a renewed energy and heightened interest in being connected to the policy process and even cultivating leadership from among the social work and public health professions to influence policy decisions all across the nation. And so in, in, in response to that, in 2017, the Clark Fox Policy Institute launched this new program to support graduate students in the School of Social Work. Uh, the program has since expanded, but just to give you an idea, some of our first cohort members um, have gone on to pursue careers staffing Senate committees, analyzing policy, advocating for numerous populations and policy reforms, community organizing, and earning advanced degrees in law and medicine. Um, the program has enjoyed just this, you know, just this incredible support and growth, and especially since we partnered with the Social Policy Institute at Washington University. And that's a university-wide initiative dedicated to addressing pressing social issues through transdisciplinary empirical research, dissemination of evidence-informed policy, and training. So it was a natural opportunity for collaboration and a way to amplify and expand this fantastic program. So we're so grateful to our scholars, um, some of whom you're gonna meet tonight. We are really just, um, it's been a fantastic synergy to see graduate students from so many different disciplines, from different parts of the world come together through this experience. 
And I'd like to acknowledge, again, the visionaries and the funders who helped to seed this vision, and that was Maxine Clark and Bob Fox. I'd also like to say just a heartfelt thank you and a deep gratitude for our fantastic group of advisors, Gary Parker, Sarah Mullen Russell, Dan Ferris, Miriam Jolson, and myself. <laughs> um, this has been a journey, especially in this climate this year, um, learning how to do it very differently, but also it's presented fantastic opportunities, one of which is tonight, the showcase. So thank you all so much. Congrats to our scholars. And I'm going to turn it back over to Dan. Well, there's a little bit of trouble with your audio, Dan. I'm sorry. My first I'm on mute of the week, and it had to be tonight. My apologies. Uh, so it is my pleasure to turn things over to Fiona, uh, actually, uh, who's going to kick things off with some student perspective and experience. Uh, thank you again for being here tonight. All right. Um, thank you, Professor Dan, and good evening to our audience. Thank you for sparing time to join us today. I'm Fiona Namatovu Shihaha Pronouns, and I'm a Master of Public Health candidate um, at the Brown School. I'm glad to have been part of the Graduate Policy Scholar Program since the fall of 2020. It has been rewarding to listen to and learn from narratives and efforts of various speakers in their different capacities on the policy journey. It has been very beneficial too to get a constructive feedback from our advisors and mentorship along the way. While we prepared for this event, we wanted to bring forth the importance of stories to shape public policy. Every social or public problem has numerous relationships along the ecological model, from the individual to interpersonal relationships, community, organizations, and systems, making it complex to explain. This complexity doesn't support talking about the entirety of the problem at once. As policy advocates or makers, we need to selectively consider what part of the narrative fits a given audience and construct it to maximize success. Finally, it is crucial to identify the settings and intervention strategies where your story matters most to enhance positive policy change. While other strategies exist, which are relevant to this process, telling a good policy story to the right audience always matters. Congratulations to you, my fellow graduate policy scholars for concluding this program, which is also the beginning of a lifelong endeavor to bring much needed change in our communities through our stories. Congratulations to us. I'll turn this back to Angelica. Thank you so much, Fiona, that was beautiful. Before we begin, I will give you the rundown on the agenda. We're gonna start with eight presenters today. We did officially have nine, but unfortunately one of our presenters has fallen ill. I will still present her and allow everyone the opportunity to reach out uh, to this particular presenter if you're interested on her topic. After the presentations are over, we will do a 10 minute Q&A session, followed by very short closing remarks. There is going to be a short five minute inter intermission for a bio break. Uh, which will be very obvious, will everyone know um, in the middle of the presentations. With that being said, I'm going to go ahead and start with our first presenter. One moment. This first presenter is going to be Joe Roder, who is an MSW MSP dual degree student at the Brown School of Social Work, Social Policy and Public Health concentrating in domestic social economic development and specializing in research. Joe is a St. Louis native, very proud of all the work he has done at Washington University. Apart from the GPS scholars, he has also recently published an op-ed surveillance crime and poverty on the source by Washington University in St. Louis. I'm gonna hand it over to Joe. Awesome, thank you so much for that uh, introduction. Just give me one moment to share my screen here. Um, you can tell how much professional clothing I had because I'm wearing the same shirt right now as I was in that picture. So this is good. Uh, yeah, so my name is Joe Roder. You see him pronouns. Um, I'm super psyched to be here. 
Um, and so, as was mentioned in my bio, uh, my op-ed, Surveillance, Crime, and Poverty, was recently published, which was a big honor for me. It was my first authorship. Um, and so I'd like to just spend this time that I have to go in a little bit deeper with this. So without further ado, surveillance, its uses and implications. We live in a world today where almost the entirety of our movements are tracked from cameras that dot the insides of businesses to those that sit atop red lights, from cameras housed inside, inside of ATMs to the security cameras outside of bank entrances, footage of our movements on a day-to-day -day basis is abundant. If one were determined enough, footage could be located of me going to the grocery store, getting coffee, buying records and driving home. We also live in a world where surplus weapons from the front lines of endless war serve out their final days in the hands of our local police forces. Tanks, helicopters, and combat gear are utilized by militant police forces to meet unarmed protesters with the full might of the US military as chemical weapons outlawed by the Geneva Convention are utilized on US citizens. Another one of these weapons of war is starting to appear in the skies above the United States city skylines, the unmanned drone. Used extensively in Afghanistan to eliminate high priority targets, this weapon of war is making a new home in the United States, but it is not dropping bombs, rather it is taking pictures. This program, which is primarily operated by persistent surveillance system, is already in use in Baltimore despite widespread community protest. It was almost implemented here in St. Louis, however, the bill, Board Bill 200, died due to lack of funding. If implemented, persistent surveillance systems would have flown three planes above our city skies for 18 hours a day, taking in 32 square miles of the city every second. While the bill did not pass the Board of Aldermen, it came terrifyingly close and begs the answer to some very pertinent questions. The first of which I wish to ask is, why is this needed? What has spurred these thoughts of an all-seeing eye in the sky? The justification laid out in the text of Board Bill 200 is the rising homicide rates within St. Louis City, which is a very real and necessary concern to address. In the year 2020, the city of St. Louis's homicide rate hit 87 deaths per 100,000 residents the highest the city's murder rate has been since the 1970s. St. Louis has always had a problem with violent crime. However, the increase in 2020 from an already high homicide rate of 64 murders per 100,000 residents raised many concerns from the citizens of St. Louis. However, would the program proposed by persistent surveillance system have any effect on the homicide rate that has vexed the city for years now? Is increased surveillance an effective counter to crime rates in general? Well, it would seem that the answer to that question is yes. A 2017 literature review of studies of the effectiveness of surveillance in lowering crime rates found that crime rates are in fact lowered by 24 to 28%. So this program does have some potential merits that are worth considering. However, what is the context of the murder spike that we saw last summer? COVID-19 decimated jobs and incomes for people all over the world and black and brown communities were especially hit hard by these effects. And what is one of the biggest drivers of crime and violent crime in society? It's poverty. It was Aristotle who said poverty is the parent of crime and according to the data, he is not wrong. I think most of us here at the Brown School are familiar with the Delmar Divide that man-made moat that separates the white intellectuals and thinkers and the black impoverished that they don't wanna be reminded of. While the poverty rate of St. Louis as a whole is declined to 10.3% below the national average, the zip code of 63120 holds a poverty rate of 39.2%. It is these concentrated areas of poverty that lead to the type of violent crime that the Board of Aldermen is attempting to fight against. I fully agree that the rising crime rates in St. Louis and the United States at large are urgent needs that need to be addressed now. However, I do not think that having a drone flying overhead photographing the city is an appropriate response. This paints the entire city as criminal. It treats every citizen as if they were already guilty in a surveillance state ripped from the pages of 1984 or Minority Report. But what should be done? It is my belief that fighting against the poverty that infects large areas of the city will simultaneously fight against the rising homicide rates and other violent crimes that we have seen over the last few years. But how do we fight against poverty? Oh no, Doc's here. There are basic things we can do. We can raise the minimum wage to a livable standard so that the allure of drug trafficking is less appealing. Why would a person who lives in poverty go out and get a job 
so that in two weeks they can get a paycheck for $250 when they need $500 right now to keep a roof over their heads. Implementing a universal basic income is another method we can utilize. This can ensure that nobody will be required to sell drugs or any other black market goods just to keep food in their stomachs. These initiatives would also make it easier for the residents of these areas to invest in their communities. Home repairs that are desperately needed to keep the classic architecture of these areas intact could be obtained more easily. A higher resource pool for the city to draw on would allow them to construct new, more effective modes of public transportation, allowing residents to find the jobs that retreated to the suburbs decades ago, and new resources such as grocery stores could be erected. Eliminating the food desert situation that plagues the northern side of Del Mar. None of these solutions have the zip or zing of an unmanned drone. They aren't ripped from an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie and you aren't going to hear them buzz over your head in the late afternoon. If they work, they will work in silence. Surveillance may work. It may be an effective way to decrease crime and homicide rates right now. However, it will not get to the heart of the issue. Under the surveillance, the wound of systemic poverty and racism will not heal. It will merely fester under the bandage. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Joe. Also, that you were right on the dot. I actually have to, that was under, way under 10 minutes. Nice job. Our second presenter, unfortunately, was unable to make it here today. I am adding her email in the chat and also still going to present her. Shuya Yin is a second year MSW student at the Brown School concentrating in mental health and specializing in research. Her prior experiences include assisting the implementation of trauma-informed model with the Missouri Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, providing clinical services for traumatized families at psychiatric hospitals and working for a Chinese public service consultation social enterprise as a project coordinator. Her research focuses on trauma-informed care and family level intervention on intergenerational violence transmission she received her BSW from the University of Chinese Ac Academy of Social Sciences in Beijing. Her work today was going to be on discussing shelter programs for those experiencing home, for families who are experiencing homelessness. And if you're still really interested in, in learning more about her work on the topic, please feel free to email her. And with that being said, I'm going to move on to the third presenter we have today, Kevin Brown. Originally from San Diego, Kevin relocated to the Chicago area in 2003 and received a Bachelor of Arts degree from Northwestern University. He spent the next 12 years supplementing creative work, teaching music for various arts education organizations, including Old Town School of Folk Music, Beverly Arts Center, and Urban Gateways, for whom he still serves on a 60th year Artist Advisory Council. I will also attest to Kevin's musical talents uh, and, and artistic talents, uh, for whom he has a lot of, uh, these organizations sent him to many dozens of Chicago public schools across a large geographical spread and his experience in these environments led him to the Brown School where he is completing an MSW with a concentrating in children, concentration in children, youth and families, focusing on school social work. He is an advocate for traditional public schools and believes new educational models should be explored and implemented within the publicly funded school system rather than outside of it. He completed his foundation practicum with the Boys and Girls Club of Greater St. Louis where he still works as a youth development professional at Nor Normandy High School and is completing his concentrating his concentration program practicum at East St. Louis School Dr District 189. Wow, Kevin, you are doing a lot. <laughs> uh, but now we're going to have him present and I'm super excited for it. Uh, thank you, Angelica, for that introduction. I, I, uh, I didn't no, you were going to have to read every word. I would have made it much shorter, but uh, um, it's good to see you. And I'll, I'll miss working with you on Intersect. Um, and yeah, thanks for the opportunity today to present. Um, and uh, I appreciate I appreciate all the work uh, that the graduate policy scholars and administration have done here. So, um, all right, I think you can see this. I'll assume you can, unless. You flag me down here. Um, as Angelica mentioned, my name is Kevin Brown. My pronouns are he, him, his. And um, 
I am a second year MSW focused on uh, children, youth, and families. I think most of my classmates probably know me as the, the public school crusader. Um, as she mentioned, I spent many years in the Chicago area uh, where I'm tuning in from today, um, working with students of all ages in, in the Chicago region, sort of an up close look at our public school systems here in Chicago. So um, my policy approach today is really focused on the teacher shortage. And um, with my background in the arts, I guess I'd like to think um, I'm sort of taking a, a creative approach to, to, to designing a, a one of many potential solutions to that shortage. So proposing what I'm calling the courtrooms to classrooms teacher training program. Um, and uh, sort of framing that as a reversal of the school to prison pipeline, which I'm sure many people here know is sort of the, the, the term we give to the sort of carceral treatment of students and schools. I, I actually just this week stumbled on a website um, where they present an image of a facility and you're supposed to guess whether it's a school or a prison. Um, I think it's like schoolprison.com, check it out. It's actually a really challenging um, quiz. Um, Cause yeah, a lot of our schools look like prisons and not only that, um, our disciplinary rates among students really sort of mirror the disproportionate um, demographics represented in our, um, in our prison systems. Um, so, so the proposed program here um, is really designed to address the state, specifically the state of Illinois' growing teacher shortage. Um, uh, you know, specifically ones capable of having a positive impact in classrooms where students look like them, predominantly Black or Latinx, um, while also providing a lane to historically obstructed career paths for previously incarcerated individuals. Um, as I sort of mentioned, the, the shortage of male teachers of color um, sort of inversely mirrors the disproportionate rates of incarcerated men of color. Um, so the courtrooms to classrooms program is designed to be sort of a mutually beneficial approach to improving learning outcomes. Um, so starting with, with teacher and student populations, you can see that over the last 10 years, uh, the percentage of students of color, student of color in Illinois have increased from 46 to 52%, while the percentage of teachers of colors, uh, teachers of color have remained static at a dismally low 18%. The public school workforce is very homogenous, 82% white and only 23% male. So taken in tandem, um, black male teachers make up less than 2% of the total teacher population. Um, moving to prisoner demographics, uh, blacks and Hispanics make up about 32% of the US population, but constitute 56% of the incarcerated population. Um, and that's a staggering statistic on top of uh, how much the United States um, you know, incarcerates. Uh, we're home to the 5% of the world's population, but 25% of its prisoners. Um, meanwhile, black Americans specifically are incarcerated at a rate of five, more than five times the rate of whites. And here in Illinois, that rate is actually worse as demonstrated by the uh, bar chart here from 2010, blacks are actually incarcerated at more than eight times the rate of whites. Um, and so, and there's plenty of evidence to, to indicate that students benefit from, from teachers who look like them. I actually was tuning in to uh, a different thing this week where a student from the East St. Louis School District where my practicum is was presenting on a statistic I'd never heard before actually where I guess a, a, a third grader, a black third grader who has had one black teacher is like 13% more likely to go to college. And if they've had two black teachers, that more than doubles to like 32 or 33%. Um, but, uh, you know, regardless of that, in addition to lower dropout rates, fewer disciplinary issues, more positive views of schooling and better test scores, um, documented among black male students who have a black male teacher, um, there's, you know, plenty of argument to be made that, um, you know, everybody would benefit from diversifying the teaching workforce. Um, you know, the, the sort of lack of a diversified teaching workforce continues to undermine egalitarianism and basically advance sort of dominant white perspectives in our classrooms. Um, meanwhile, there's a very large bed of evidence indicating that educational, uh, sorry, educational programs in prisons are a, are a smart investment. So for every dollar invested in prison education, 
um, state taxpayers say $5 due to reduced recidivism rates. And, and recidivism goes down basically the higher the degree is. Um, but there's strong evidence for a, for a good return on investment for these programs in general. Um, unfortunately, Illinois currently only has like nine higher education programs in prisons. Uh, I think they're only serving seven actual facilities. Most of them are private institutions and grant funded. So I will talk a little later about sort of ways to grow that through more com um, community college investment. But I couldn't find any actual programs focused specifically on training teachers uh, sort of modeled after what, what we call um, alternative teacher training programs. Uh, and I'll talk about that a little later as well. So, so you might be thinking at this point, like, do we really want previously incarcerated individuals teaching our children? And that is a fair concern, um, but there's many ways we can sort of limit eligibility here, right? So uh, violent crimes, sex related crimes would make uh, individual ineligible. Um, with regard to drug crimes, we sort of know that despite comparable rates of drug use, Black Americans, especially in cities, are much more likely than other groups to be arrested and incarcerated for drug-related crimes. Um, and unfortunately, that does disqualify them in, forever from being, becoming a teacher. So I would, I would advocate for sort of changing that to account for some um, opportunities for, for drug offenders. But until that happens, uh, we can sort of still work with just the current incarcerated population to, to you know, have a pretty like large pool of candidates here. Um, so on the left, you sort of see, um, I think this data is from 2015, different severity of felonies. Um, so if we limited it to just the bottom three classes, two through four, you'd still have 43% of felons in consideration. Um, if you eliminated not just violent crime, sex crimes, and drug, and as well as drug crimes, you'd still have a fifth of the prison prisoners eligible there. And then on the right, we're sort of reminded that a lot of people in our criminal justice system are not actually in jails or prisons. Um, uh, so if we just limited eligibility or sort of focus this group to individuals on probation or parole, we'd still have 65% um, eligible for training to become teachers. Um, I just wanna highlight a few things that are sort of like currently happening in the state or elsewhere that, that would help uh, sort of in the same vein of this proposal, um, starting with an investment in community colleges. Um, as I mentioned, most of the programs currently operating in prisons are sort of privately funded or private in universities. Um, and Illinois has, has uh, invested about half as much in community colleges in the last 20 years. Meanwhile, California has sort of reinvested, reinvested in its community colleges with incentives to participate in prison, prison education programs. And, um, they've grown their presence in prisons from like two to 34 out of 35 of their correctional facilities just in the last like six years. So it can definitely be done. Um, here in Illinois, or sorry, the Pell Grants, this is a national initiative that's actually part of a recent COVID bill. Um, we, uh, since 1994, Pell Grants have not been available to prisoners, but um, the Department of Education now has until 2023 to reinstate uh, Pell Grant access to people in prisons. And this could save Illinois between eight and $26 million annually. Um, and I would argue that for a program like this, Pell Grants should be eligible to be used. Um, also in Illinois, just a month or two ago, Governor Pritzker passed a big education bill that included the so-called Minority Teachers of Illinois Scholarship Program, um, allotting roughly $3 million um, to encourage students of color to pursue teaching careers at preschool or elementary school levels. Once they're done with that program, they have to teach in a school that has at least 30% uh, students of color enrolled. I think this is a good start. I think that percentage could be much higher. Um, as we know in cities like Chicago and St. Louis, especially if say like East St. Louis, the percentage of students of color enrolled is closer to 95 to 100% um, students of color. And those are the schools where I really think a program like this would benefit. And then alternative teacher training programs that sort of offer an accelerated track to getting a teaching certificate in any given state have been very popular among uh, people of color in recent years. And, and this program could basically be modeled after those. Um, so this is my last slide. I know I'm like pretty much out of time here. Um, I'm gonna drop these two links that you see um, in the chat when I'm done, just sort of focusing on like, an, like a, the Economic Policy Institute's most recent report on on sort of how to address the teacher shortage at large and then these other three colorful boxes coming from a, a, 
a report that more specifically identifies recommendations for recruiting, retaining, and, and giving mobility to teachers of color. And so if you want to learn more on this, I would uh, encourage you to check out those links. And then um, I have also have a more detailed um, sort of policy brief on this subject. I'm happy to share any additional resources that uh, you might be interested in or talk more at the Q&A. But I think I'm out of time. So, th so thank you again. And, uh, and, um, and back to you, Angelica. Appreciate it. You did really wonderfully on time. OK, Very thanks. wonderfully. Joe, Kevin, I'm really impressed with the presenter. So far, the presentations have been amazing. The amount of knowledge you all have is really outstanding, incredible. And as Kevin mentioned, and as if you can see in the chat, if you have any questions and you're scared you're going to forget, go ahead, write them in the chat now. We will address them at the Q&A session. Great job, presenters. I'm going to move on to the next one. Jada Foster, who also did this work uh, in, with Denine Carter. Um, they're both MSW classmates and advocates for the protection of school-aged children, grades K through 12, as part of an assignment for Dr. Hussein Tief. D9 and Jada chose to explore the positive and negative effects on said demographic during the COVID-19 global pandemic and school shutdowns. D9's focus was dedicated to the benefits of the children that stayed at home during the pandemic, especially for children and families of color. As Jada explored the vulnerabilities of all children without access to an academic environment during this time, Jada will be sharing this and the words of fellow GPS member Marla Gungheimer, sobering experience for the showcase while Denine prepares to move to St. Louis from Michigan. However, both women are honored to be part of this event in any form and I'm really grateful for the work that you both did on this topic. Uh, and so happy, Jada, that you could be here today to, to present on it. Thank you so much. I'm honored as well. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And the present mode. OK. Hello, sweet humans. Um, I'd like to thank you for your time and presence in advance. Also, out of respect for your emotional and mental health, I'd like to forewarn all watching this segment of the Graduate Policy Scholars event that I will be speaking about childhood neglect, illness, abuse, and death. It's a tender topic, especially in relationship to race, and I respect your decision to step away from this information now or at any point during this presentation. Also, Deneen Carter, my fellow classmate and co-creator of this debate, will not be with us tonight um, to share her portion of this work there will be a DC at the bottom of the slides that she created to honor her work. Since her focus on this project differs from mine, you are welcome to direct all comments or questions about her portion to her or your preferred search engine. In the first part of 2020, the world fell beneath an inauspicious shadow in the form of a global pandemic. More commonly known as COVID-19 or the coronavirus spread all over the world. The fear of the virus throttled our daily routines for better or worse. From China to our little pocket of the world in the St. Louis area, the mental, physical and financial health of humanity was completely compromised. As we all know, compromised is an understatement. We all got rocked. Although every person on this planet struggled in some way, for the sake of this assignment, we're going to focus on school-aged children K through 12 in Illinois and address the economics of protection during such a life-altering tragedy. In March of 2020, the United States Department of Health, along with other US institutional powers, required all schools to end in-person instruction. This meant that 50,000 schools throughout our nation were shut down. Teachers and students and faculty were sent home in an effort to stop the spread of COVID-19. COVID-19, for those of you who are still seeking a definition, can be summarized as such. The coronavirus is a family of viruses native to people and a variety of animals such as bats, camels, and cats. Multiple forms of coronavirus exist. However, COVID-19 is a new strain that has never been seen in humans 
before. The source of the strain has yet to be identified and symptoms can range from mild to severe respiratory illness. And currently there is no cure for COVID-19. However, many people are considered asymptomatic and will not experience any symptoms. Children, school-age children can be looped into this category. At the time that we created this debate, Deneen and myself, it was November of 2020. The numbers of confirmed cases in the US preceded all other countries by the millions. During this month, or at the time that Deneen and I presented our findings, the US peaked at 12 million positive cases of COVID-19. Based on these numbers, Deneen found the importance of students K through 12 to stay at home and stop the spread and her reasons are incredibly valid. The number and rate of cases, the number and rate of cases in children in the US had a steady increase from March to July of 2020. March 1st through September 19th, 2020, nearly 300,000 laboratory confirmed cases in school age children were reported in the United States. Evidence suggests that children likely have the same or higher viral loads. Although the cumulative rate is low, one in three children hospitalized with COVID-19 were admitted to an intensive care unit, so the risk is not negligible. Ultimately, Deneen's argument was that the infectious, the infections among children is lower compared to adults, but have the power to spread more rapidly throughout the adult population. And at the time, the nation was in the third wave of the highest numbers since the onset of the virus. Deneen also broke down the risk for school-aged children from low to medium to high, depending on the form of contact they experienced. The pandemic shook numerous social justice issues to the surface, especially for people of color. People of color have a higher risk of dying due to COVID-19 complications. Although youth grade K through 12 have a greater chance of contact and recovery. The question that Deneen asked, what about the caregivers? The real life experience and stats on the screen outline that exact situation. Children are carriers and have the ability to spread to siblings, caretakers who may already have a compromised immune system and other elders in multi-generational households, which are more common in families of color than white families. The virus does not discriminate against age. And as we've learned, it will spread rapidly without quarantine. The images on this screen do not have an age, but you can see that she was trying to convey how quickly the spread can occur from a school age child to parents, to grandparents, and to other members of the family. Deneen argued that the shutdown of the schools was helpful to stop the, the spread of COVID-19. And it did. Did the order protect school-aged children though? Grades K through 12? Yes. But only from the virus, not from abuse. As we attempt to protect vulnerable demographics from the virus, has the nation taken the time to think about the harm the shutdown has caused children who are forced to stay at home? The new federal child abuse and neglect data shows an increase in the number of child victims who suffered maltreatment for the first time since 2015. As in past years, rates of abuse and neglect are highest among infants and grade school age children. Although child abuse reports have plummeted since the virus arrived, as mentioned previously, this doesn't mean that American children are safe. Since the coronavirus pandemic forced schools to close and families to stay home, pediatricians and emergency room staff are seeing a rapid increase of injuries involving children. These with injuries so visible, a broken arm, a beat up face, that the adult who may have caused the injuries had to seek help. Children have been so severely injured during this pandemic, they end up in the emergency room and intensive care units in some hospitals they're dying at an unusually high rate. And again, it's not because they tested 
it's not because they tested positive for COVID. To put 40.6% decrease in child maltreatments in perspective, In 2018, 4.3 million child maltreatment referral reports were received. Types of maltreatment vary, and some children experience more than one or two types, or even three types. From the 2018 report, over 400,000 victims were neglected, over 72,000 victims were physically abused, and nearly 50,000 victims were sexually abused. And sadly, 91.7% of victims are typically maltreated by one or both parents. Pre-COVID statistics show that almost five children die every day from child abuse. So 365 times five, that's nearly 2000 per day. However, generally it's estimated that between 50 to 60% of maltreatment fatalities are not recorded on death certificates. Statistically speaking, no group or child is immune from being a victim of child abuse or neglect. Although girls are more often victim than boys. And, um, uh, uh, and an important point, statistically and experientially, during times of unemployment, domestic and child abuse, during times of unemployment, domestic and child abuse increases. Sadly, children can carry the virus. However, The harm COVID is causing children compared to adults is minimal. As, as of a CDC report from 2012, 2020, I apologize. To increase during times, okay. Um, there we go. School age children ages five to 14, that means 100, so 111 was the death toll. And then ages 15 to 24, it's 574. Provisional death counts are based on death certificate data received and coded by the National Center for Health Statistics. Thus, those statistics may not count for the child who may have suffered a death from COVID. The stay at home order injured or killed more US children in an attempt to protect them. However, in the words of Dr. Mira Levinson of Harvard's Graduate School of Education, we may have made life harder for children and simultaneously taken away the access point so many kids have to the services they need. That said, I argued that school-aged children should have gone back to school sooner for access to mandated reporters, technology, childcare, food, rest, and all which sit under the umbrella of protection. Thank you so much for, um, for listening to my presentation. And I apologize for the stumbles. I think I accidentally deleted some slides before I started presenting. That was, that was very beautifully done. I also Thank want you. to apologize to you, Deneen. If you're watching this at any point, if you're watching this now, I'm sorry, I messed up your sacred name. Um, and also thank you so much to you, Jada, and you, Deneen, for working on this really important topic. Uh, it was, again, very beautifully done. We're gonna move on to our next presenter. And you've already heard her speak. Fiona Namatobu is a Master of Public Health student at the Brown School of Washington University in St. Louis. She currently serves as a graduate research assistant with the International Center for Child Health and Development, ICHAD, and Smart Africa Center. Previously, Fiona's primary job functions included study coordination, data entry and management, mentorship, and data collection for NIH-funded research studies at ICHAD in Uganda. A firm believer in implementation science, Fiona is passionate about addressing contextual barriers related to the social determinants of health for low resource communities. She is also interested in how policy can enhance the uptake of evidence-based practices and ultimately improve the health outcomes for children and their families. Really excited to hear your presentation and thank you. Um, thank you, Angelica. 
I'll just share my screen. Um, so, um, good evening again. I'm just trying to set myself up well. So, um, good evening again, uh, Fiona Namatovu again. Um, so education access and quality is a critical explanation for public health disparities as it links to um, good employment opportunities, access to good nutrition and healthcare, social capital and general wellness. Um, my education story has been one of resource av availability, but uh, when resources got cut down along the years, there were opportunities available for me to advance through school until today and growing up I had questions about education access for children from that, uh, because children were out of school at the wrong time and engaged in some kind of business to earn a living. Um, my work experience with the International Center for Child Health and Development brought me right in the middle of um, public school structures and the economic disparities that families face to have children complete even the first level of education. So I'll be talking about education in the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, the situation in Uganda does not differ much from what my previous pre presenter talked about. And I'll just talk about maybe another perspective of, of the situation. So a little background here, Uganda is a country in East Africa whose population currently stands at about 45.7 million as of 2020 and education is delivered over four tier system, seven years of primary education or elementary school, uh, six years of secondary education, four years of lower secondary and two years of advanced uh, education with about three to five years of uh, tertiary education. I'll focus mostly on primary or elementary uh, school education for this presentation. And in Uganda, education is compulsory at the elementary level uh, for children ages six to 13. However, only nine in a hundred primary school aged children are um, not enrolled in school. So um, this graph presents um, pupil to teacher ratios for primary education in Uganda, but I'll basically explain the peak, which is a period around uh, 1997, when the government of Uganda introduced universal primary education, which is supposed to be free in courts, uh, but not entirely free. Uh, this period saw school enrollment uh, increase. However, this has not been well matched with basic education resources, including uh, teacher availability. And so this brings us to our problem for today. Um, so learning poverty is a term describing the inability for students to read and understand a simple text by age 10, which is three years below the average age at which students should be graduating into secondary school from elementary school in Uganda. 83 in 100 students at late primary age are non proficient in reading. And this is after adjusting for those who are out of school. Um, at this rate, Uganda's learning poverty rate is 3.9 percentage points above the average for Sub-Saharan Africa and 7.1 percentage points better than the average for uh, low and middle income countries. Uh, so when the COVID-19 uh, pandemic struck in Uganda, all schools were closed in March and later on in October of 2020, the president opened schools for candidates and finalists in higher learning institutions. In the meantime, government implemented lessons on televisions, through media houses, radios, and encouraged private entities to adjust as they could manage. However, there was a gap.
um, the first picture shows um, IT access variations for different modes to deliver education material in Uganda with the pandemic. And we see that um, radio access is the biggest, which is about 65.3%. Uh, there is about 21.8% access to televisions in uh, homes in Uganda. Um, household telephone um, ownership is at about 10.8%, internet access at 10.8%, and computer access or ownership to uh, at 5.9%. However, electricity is needed to power these technologies, but electricity access to the national electricity grid in Uganda is only 8% in rural areas uh, versus 71.2% in urban areas. In regard to infrastructure development, differences are evident between rural and uh, urban settings with teacher to student ratios required to be at one to 40. However, uh, from the graph previously, we see these ranges from uh, 45 to 59 um, to one student teacher ratio over the 20 years of the universal education starting. So the digital divide largely affects rural areas, hence economic and educational inequality, and the large number of pupils worsens the learning environment and it becomes hard to teach. Um, and so, even though there is about 85% enrollment in school for rural versus urban settings at 91%, completion rates are much lower with about 14% and 38% um, for secondary education. Um, so, what is the significance for looking at this topic? Uh, Uganda has about 75% of its population um, below the age of 30, and Uganda's Vision 2020 presents education as a mechanism for education, um, economic growth, and human capital development. The World Bank also launched a new operational global learning target to cut the learning property rate by at least a half by 2030, and that was before the pandemic struck. However, with COVID-19, um, we see that learning is synonymous with technology and there are huge gaps in technology access for rural versus urban populations in Uganda, hence inequality in reach. 85% 80 of school age children reside in uh, rural areas, <coughs> which are characterized by lack of basic resources and underdeveloped infrastructure. Um, in, in regards to um, COVID-19 responses, these didn't differ much across the world like it was in um, Uganda. So we see that uh, public schools did not really have the capacity to afford um, strategies like disinfecting schools. And so that kept them um, closed for a longer period of time compared to private schools. And there is no technology access for teachers and students to continue with the learning um, over the pandemic period. What did this um, imply? That there are longer school closures, instructional time was lost with the lockdown. Uh, there were lack of resources to support students and there were high school dropouts uh, due to early pregnancies and marriages with the lockdown, and then uh, the higher cost of education. Um, my specific objective in looking at this is to see how does Uganda reform education infrastructure, uh, revise teacher training curriculums to incorporate technology use and remote instruction, increase education sector financing, and also improve overall education structure to promote a student-focused learning through the curriculum revision and policy enforcement. Uh, my recommendations on the short term include surveillance to get feedback on reach and quality, better remuneration for teachers, intersectoral uh, partnerships to contribute to teacher training and student curriculum changes, as well as implementation science to develop working solutions. And in the long term, we would see um, an increase in infra in infrastructure investment and um, with priority to expand access to internet and digital solutions for all children, 
changing training for teachers and education delivery strategies, as well as multiple delivery channels for um, in-person and remote learning outcomes. And so the Ministry of Education would have to work on re-evaluation of education policy, plan to align education sector goals with country, region, and global targets, uh, increase monitoring of education sector funding to avoid corruption and misappropriation, as well as partner with existing organizations focused on research and implementation in the education sector. Uh, this is just one last quote, and so scale up cannot happen without leadership from education institutions and professional societies, as well as from government and communities. We need long term commitments to secure sustainability and outside forces through funding will not motivate and sustain change in countries. Leadership must come from within, and this is from a professor at Macquarie University in Uganda. Thank you very much for listening. I really wish we had our applause reaction button somewhere because all our presenters have been just incredible. Fiona, great presentation. Uh, we will take a quick five minute bio break, everyone. And just, I know I am in awe of all the presenters so far and we have four more to break. You got the sip of water, sip of tea, whatever you needed, get comfortable. I am happy to introduce our next presenter, Kate Hensley, a second year MSW student with a concentration in mental health. Kate is a graduate policy scholar in training through the Clark Fox Policy Institute at the Brown School and a current practicum student at the Pediatric Transgender Center at Washington University School of Med Medicine and St. Louis Children's Hospital. While Kate is drawn towards mental health treatment and disparity in access, she is also more globally interested in healthcare equity and policy with disability justice, queer theory, and critical race theory lenses. Some of Kate's recent academic work has focused on racial health disparities in acute psychiatric treatment, gestational parent pre and postpartum treatment access, and sexual health education as trauma intervention for disabled adults. After graduation, Kate is most interested in pursuing policy and advocacy on a macro level social work with the ability to maintain community engagement and organizing. And without further ado, I am so happy for your presentation, Kate. Thank you so much, Angelica. I really appreciate all the work you're doing to support us uh, as scholars tonight. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. Okay, so I, I also love how we talk about storytelling in policy. Um, so I really um, also wanted to kind of embrace that um, that uh, thought as well. So tonight, I am starting here with a little bit of, of personal background. Um, so um, this is me at 17. Um, this was during a time where I spent uh, almost a full year in residential mental health treatment. This was preceding um, multiple hospitalizations for mental health treatment as well. Um, and I'm, I'm really interested in sharing this with you tonight, uh, just so you can better understand that um, my work in examining patient protection and psychiatric care is really informed by both academic, professional, and personal experience. So um, I started my first psychotropic medication at the age of 13. By 17, in these photos, I was on upwards of 10 different psychotropic medications at a time. Um, eight years earlier, preceding my prescription of an SSRI for antidepressant treatment, the FDA had already issued a black box warning on SSRI induced suicidality in teenagers and young adults. What I'm really interested in emphasizing here tonight for you all too is um, my, my privilege and my access that I have been afforded in mental health treatment. So. I had access to treatment teams who felt like they were um, making decisions around my medication and my treatment and care um, that was uh, best informed by current evidence and research. While my access has now kind of shifted my personal thought process around that, um, this is not something that most folks, particularly with serious mental illness like I have, um, are afforded the privilege of access to. 
So um, throughout my graduate career, I have really contended with how my mental illness impacts and both my academic work um, and how I engage on a personal and professional level when discussing issues of behavioral health that really hit home for me personally. So I also really wanted to emphasize how I've been supported by the Policy Scholar Program. Um, so I, I initially um, became really interested in policy work because it made me really angry. Um, I couldn't figure out what the politics and the social dynamics behind policy reform really looked like. Um, and by um, gaining access to mentors like Professor Ferris, I feel like I've really um, had an opportunity to get my foot in the door that has um, valued my lived experience as it informs policy practice and connected me to folks to engage with that um, can really support me in this journey of understanding how these social systems are built and maintained within the United States. Um, I'm also honored to be among a community of peers who are pioneering the future of what policy practice looks like um, and engaging in both a St. Louis community level and a national um, federal policy level. So what I'm going to be focusing on here tonight, and I've got my policy brief up here um, for you folks, but what I'm focusing on um, tonight is uh, patient protection in psychiatric care. Uh, particularly focusing on the black box warning issued in 2004 for antidepressants by the FDA, which was then later updated in 2007 to include both adolescents and young adults. To give you a bit of background here, SSRIs are the most prescribed medication for both mild to moderate depression and are um, typically a first response treatment. So while evidence informs best practice that says folks should be seeing um, therapists and receiving behavioral health intervention first. Most people on antidepressants have only received that antidepressant care. And um, unfortunately in clinical trials, research shows that um, these drugs, particularly SSRIs, do not perform significantly better than placebo medication. Also, SSRI treatment relies upon what's called the monoamine hypothesis. And you've probably heard about this in some way, shape, or form. So you might have heard somebody say, oh, I have reduced uh, dopamine, or um, I don't get enough serotonin. Um, and these are depleted levels of neurotransmitters within the brain. And really, at this point, that theory has been disproven. Um, so it's it centers on kind of and maintains this ableist understanding of what mental illness looks like, um, that a particular cure exists, and that folks with serious mental illness and with mental illness in general are willing to do whatever it takes to get that cure. So a little bit more about what psychiatric treatment looks like. Um, it's vital for me to emphasize that um, psychiatric treatment, much like the medical industrial complex, historically and currently preys on Black, Indigenous, and people of color disproportionately, both routinely over and under prescribing. So actually in antidepressants, um, particularly Black patients who come in for antidepressant treatment are more likely to get under prescribed. Um, and this is significant because we know that antidepressant is the first line intervention. So even when people are coming in with similar symptom levels, um, Black patients are not receiving care for those symptoms of depression. Um, also, we know that BIPOC are disproportionately diagnosed and incarcerated with serious mental illnesses um, and uh, significantly and, and illnesses that, that um, can carry significant stigma. So it's also important to know that most drug trials, particularly within the United States, are funded by big pharmaceutical companies. These com companies then inflate the efficacy of the drugs that they generate and de-emphasize the side effects that are included. Um, a fantastic example of this, or maybe an alarming example of this, um, is the backlash that Eli Lilly faced after multiple very public completed suicides by adolescents after the introduction of the first SSRI Prozac. And the other very important thing to note is that discontinuation reactions when coming off of antidepressants occur at extremely high rates um, and is incredibly under-researched. 
Um, it's also important to note that for folks with uh, illnesses deemed more serious, discontinuation of medication is often not presented as an option. So I've been taking psychotropic medication for over a decade, um, and not once have I had a treatment provider say, this is something we should look at for either causing or contributing to your symptoms. So what I am arguing here is that psychiatrists and truly the medical industrial complex hold the sanity of mad, mentally ill and disabled folks in their hand as big pharma whispers in their ear. So what can we do as policy scholars, as social workers, as community members? Um, so to, to learn a little bit more about this black box warning here, um, our studies have shown, we, there's a lot of critical debate that occurs about the results of the black box warning. And what it truly all boils down to um, is that studies have shown increased sales of antidepressants lead to increased completed rates of suicide among youth. And a majority of the time, non-psychiatrist physicians are the ones prescribing these antidepressants. These are folks who do not have specialized understanding and knowledge of these drugs that they're administering. And they also, studies have shown, don't have a great understanding and recall of what those black box warnings are. Um, additionally, there's uh, extensive documentation of what's called protracted withdrawal syndrome, syndrome, where folks who've taken these drugs experienced effects for years to come. So here is what we can do. Um, on the right here is Leroy Moore, co-founder of Sins Invalid, pioneer in disability justice. Um, please check out his work and um, disability justice scholarly work in general if you're not familiar. Um, but what I argue is that um, more must be done within mental health care to prioritize holistic disability affirming care for mad, mentally ill and disabled individuals. What this looks like is prioritizing what's called shared decision making. So really a partnership between the prescribing physician and the patient coming in with symptoms. Um, while this makes a lot of sense logically, of course shared decision making should occur. Um, it's rarely actualized because of the degree of power imbalance. So what I argue as a policy scholar um, is that we have to re-examine these black box warnings to really look at how can we strengthen this patient protection to allow for informed consent to actually occur. So I'm gonna end with just this quote on the right from Leroy Moore, which says that all bodies are unique and essential. All bodies are whole, all bodies have strengths and needs that must be met. We are powerful, not despite the complexities of our bodies, but because of them, we move together with no body left behind. That is what disability justice looks like. And I think that that is what um, bolstering the black box warning for these drugs would reflect in our policy work. Thank you so much, Kate, for sharing your story, your work and your heart. And I apologize for the dog. <laughs>
Okay, so today um, my work is on reauthorization of the Violence Against Women's Act of 2021. So first of all, what is the Violence Against Women's Act? It is the act that seems to protect women and everybody from domestic violence, all forms of abuse, and it was enacted in 1994. Um, and every five years is supposed to be reauthorized. So it has been reauthorized um, three times in 2000, 2005, and then 2013. It expired in 2018. December 21, but since then it hasn't been reauthorized, and I will get to know why in the course of this presentation. So, the reason why it hasn't been reauthorized is because of two new provisions. Every um, every five years before it's reauthorized, it's adds on new provisions, and then the fund the funding is also increased. So, 2000 had an expansion of the provisions, 2005 also had an expansion and that has been it over the years. But in, 20, in 2018, it added two new provisions, which is the gun restrictions and also to protect transgender women, as we can see on the screen. And the bone of contention why it has still not been reauthorized since 2018 is on the gun restrictions where people who have history or records of abuse or being perpetrators of violence cannot be able to purchase or possess a gun. And this is mainly because the National Rifle Association opposed the bill in 2019. And then most of us here know that um, they are a major sponsor of the Republican Party. So that is the reason why they have also opposed this bill all the way from 2019 to date. What is the implication? So prior to the pandemic, we had like so many people experiencing violence, almost like 20 people every minute are physically abused by their partners in the US. And then one in four women, one in nine men also experience severe intimate partner violence. And just this past year, because of the pandemic, we saw an 8.1% increase in domestic violence incidents because of lockdowns and then stay home orders. And looking at some statistics from 2018 about homicide where females were the victims, these are the top highest ranked states where um, females were murdered by males. And we could see the numbers here, they are very triggering. That is just for 2018 alone and Missouri was the second. Nine out of 10 victims knew their offenders. So these people who were murdered, they knew their offenders. Of the victims who knew their offenders, 63% were wives or intimate acquaintances of their killers. And then there are 11 times, 11 times as many females were murdered by males that they knew as compared to those who were murdered by males they do not know. And then the most common weapons that were used in this homicide were firearms. And let's, let us not forget that firearms are the main reason why the VAWA is being stored in the Senate. So on the onset of the pandemic, we all know like many survivors were locked up in their homes with their abusers due to stay home orders or lockdown measures, which increased violence. And resources and efforts were all geared towards like responding to the pandemic as compared to like domestic violence. And we all know that many shelters were also closed and they are continue to be closed. So these people do not have anywhere to turn to for assistance, having in mind that the VAWA is still not, has still not been reauthorized. And the UN Women calls um, um, the domestic violence as a shadow pandemic in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. So what is the impact of delaying the reauthorization of the VAWA? So we all know that victims of violence are mostly women and compared to other races, black women are four times higher to experience sexual and psychological abuse and three times more to be murdered by males as compared to other races. And when women, experience violence and all manner of abuses, we know it affects their participation in education, 
um, employment and public and social life, which increases what Elizabeth Siegel calls the feminization of poverty. We get more women becoming poor because of domestic violence, which is preventing them from participating in these spheres of life. And the VAWA also um, gives out funds to shelters and colleges to implement programs and services to protect survivors and their families and also make sure that their perpetrators are, uh, um, are jailed or prosecuted. So when this, whilst VAWA is being stored, these um, agencies are also not getting enough funds that they need to implement these programs and services to protect survivors and their families. And already these funds are insufficient. And then now, the, um, non, now that is the VAWA has not been reauthorized, they are not even getting any funds at all. And also we all know that the pandemic has also increased the needs of survivors. And then on the state as a whole, it reduces productivity. If people are experiencing violence, they are hurt or they are killed for a certain period of time, it reduces their productivity. They can't be at work. And also, as I said, it increases poverty rate and it costs more to pay for the violence damages than it is to implement protection and prevention programs. According to the National Alliance to End Violence, it said it would cost the country $14.8 billion of responding to violence that has already happened, like paying for the damages that have been caused compared to just 1.6 billion to implement protection and prevention services and programs. So we all can see like, it's like 13 million, 13 billion worth of money just going down the drain. So who, who is benefiting? Um, VAWA 20, 2021, as we are hoping for it to be reauthorized this year, and then that will be the name, would restrict the purchase and possession of firearms, as I said, by people who have records of abuse or violence. And as long as it is not, it is not reauthorized, they will continue to be, I mean, increased sales and possession of guns by everybody, whether you have like record or history of violence or not. So this is a question for us all here. So in this case, who benefit? You are free to put your answer in the chat, but this is food for thought. As it's being delayed, people can buy arms. Who do you think is benefiting? So my recommendation, my policy recommendation is like Congress should reauthorize VAWA as soon as they can, because we know like the pandemic is making it very tough for survivors of domestic violence and other forms of abuse and violence. And also, I am proposing that there should be a permanent reauthorization so that um, it wouldn't have to go through Congress. Every five years, it would be um, reauthorized without it going through Congress and all that. So, and then the president must also involve social workers and policy analysts in the process of reauthorization. We can only see policymakers doing all the work when it comes to this, but we also need social workers. Thank you for listening. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you so much, Portia. The, the, it was very impactful and also just reminds me of the relevance of talking about FAWA, talking about firearms now, especially with what we're seeing in the news. Um, all of these subject matters are really important and really relevant. And thank you for that question because now I'm going to be thinking about that. <laughs> Might hold on some Q&A questions for later as well. So I'm going to move on to the next presenter again. Thank you so much. And our next presenter is Tyler Frank, a second year PhD student in the Public Health Sciences program at the Brown School. Tyler's research interests involve the intersection of adverse childhood experiences and financial security, family friendly work policies and the built environment. Tyler has been working with the Social Policy Institute on projects involving food security, COVID-19 and household financial security. He has also explored the nuances of adverse health concerns in low income populations and the ways that innovative evidence-based practices in public health are implemented in underserved communities. Thank you so much, Tyler. I'm excited for your presentation. Awesome. Thanks, Anhalika. 
I'm going to share my screen. All right, so I was more, I was honestly thinking about the best way to uh, share this information. So I decided to switch it up and share this as an infographic. And so today I'm going to be talking to you all about environmental justice, advocating for underrepresented communities. So I wanna start with a couple of questions. How would you feel if you were at risk of experiencing health problems due to the location of your neighborhood? What if your risk of adverse environmental exposures increased because of your race? So for some people, these questions are what if statements or alternate realities, but for many individuals, uh, these questions actually involve the lived experiences of real people. And so I'm gonna be talking about environmental justice through the Environmental Justice Mapping Data Collection Act of 2021, which is also called HR 516. So this particular bill was introduced in the House on January 28th this year by Representative Cori Bush from Missouri, and most recently referred to the Subcommittee on Environment and Climate Change uh, this year in February. And so I actually was intrigued by this bill because uh, Cori Bush was the one that sponsored it. And so it caught my eye. There's also an identical bill in the Senate called uh, Senate Bill 101. And it was introduced by Senators Edward Markey and Tammy Duckworth uh, from Massachusetts and Illinois respectively. And so before going into more detail, I wanna give a definition of environmental justice communities before going into some of the history. So environmental justice communities are communities with significant representation of communities of color, low income communities, or tribal and indigenous communities that experience or at, or at risk of experiencing higher or more adverse human health or environmental effects as compared to other communities. So I'm gonna talk about some of the background on environmental justice and the movement and just so you have an idea of like where it came from and some of the monumental events that led to where we are today. So this is not by all means an exhaustive list of the background on environmental justice, but just a snapshot of some of the key events. So the environmental justice movement was started primarily by people of color who address an equity of environmental protection and the public health dangers to their communities and loved ones. So the first big event was the Memphis sanitation strike in 1968. And that particular event occurred during the civil rights era in the 1960s. There was also a sit-in against Warren County in North Carolina um, to oppose a landfill uh, bin being put inside this county. So in, in, with context, this particular county was actually one of the few counties in North Carolina that was predominantly black. Um, and even after protests, environmental advocates did not win, but the issue showed the burden of the United States environmental problems on low income people of color. And it was actually the first time an environmental protest by people of color resulted in national attention. And then right below that, there was a report done called Toxic Waste and Race in the US by the United Church of Christ Commission on Racial Justice. And it was the first study of its kind to address issues of race, class and environment on a national level. And so the results from the study suggested the existence of patterns demonstrating that communities with larger proportions of minorities are more likely to live near sites of commercial hazardous waste facilities. And um, there's a concentration of uncontrolled toxic waste sites, specifically in black and Latinx communities, especially in urban locations. So why is this bill necessary? So this particular bill would direct 40% of President Biden's climate investment toward disproportionately impacted communities, which is huge. Um, and so also this aligns with the Biden-Harris plan of equitable clean energy future. And so this involves securing environmental justice and equitable economy opportunity and invest in communities that have been harmed by racist and unjust environmental practices to promote a clean and climate safe future. So this is intentional to really help people that have been disadvantaged after so many generations by um, environmental racism and unjust practices. And so I was interested in looking at the literature 
to see what other evidence exists in terms of environmental racism. And so I found some articles um, and there are definitely more out there, but these are two that I want to highlight really briefly. So one is an article from the 2012 and environmental health perspectives that demonstrated that overall levels of particulate matter exposure for people of color were higher than those for white people. Then there was another study in 2016 in Environment International that showed long-term exposure to particulate matter was associated with racial segregation. It was also in this 2016 study, it was the first study to examine racial isolation and air pollution in non-urban areas. And what race, racial isolation means is basically racial groups that are only um, living around each other and aren't exposed to other racial groups. So isolated racial groups. Also, this association was strongest in rural communities in the Midwest. So this is more of a national study. Um, and then looking at uh, more of a local context since the Brown School is in St. Louis and many folks on this call um, are associated with the Brown School or familiar with St. Louis. And so I was curious to see what do the stats look like in the St. Louis area. So in St. Louis City, Black children are 2.4 times more likely than white children to test positive for lead in their blood. Also, Black children make 10 times more emergency room visits for asthma each year than white children. Furthermore, Black neighborhoods experience most of the city's illegal trash dumping. So these stats are not just a coincidence. It's, again, the result of um, environmental injustice. And as Congresswoman Cori Bush put it, environmental justice is racial justice. And so really tackling these issues requires looking at them in an anti-racist lens um, and, and examining it um, through racial equity and trying to ensure that all groups are living in areas that are safe and healthy and where they can thrive. And so going back to the bill, so what does this bill 516 do? It establishes an interagency environmental justice mapping committee that must create a tool to identify environmental justice communities. It also mandates the establishment of an environmental justice data repository by the Environmental Protection Agency that must be made available to regional, state, local, and tribal governments. So I love this particular part of this bill because it really highlights the importance of transparency and making data accessible to communities that will benefit from it. It also recognizes the importance of the data to guide corrective action and contribute to overcoming barriers to environmental justice. So I, when I, how I look at this is that this, this tackling these issues will take a lot of system to change and it's an iterative process. So you document data and record indicators that um, are important, um, but maybe there's some things that need to be modified to you know, make sure that it's collected um, to the utmost quality. And so there are also additional insights um, to this bill. So it's an emphasis on including an advocate on the committee with real lived experience with issues of environmental justice. So this is extremely important because having someone with personal experiences can offer insight that others on the committee may not have and it can really inform your work. It also positions communities that have been impacted by environmental racism to see policy outcomes that will directly improve their lives and it provides a transparent process for the federal government to collaborate with environmental justice partners and stakeholders. So I was curious to see um, which um, areas uh, actually support this particular bill. So this is a map that um, highlights representatives from 23 states and territories that are co-sponsors on the bill, which also includes Missouri. There are also um, more than 70 grassroots and environmental organizations um, that are supportive of this bill as well, which includes Alternatives for Community and Environment, Missouri Coalition for the Environment, Action St. Louis, Deep South Center for Environmental Justice, St. Louis County Branch of the NAACP, and an additional more than 40 leading environmental justice scholars. And so to end, what can you do? This is a call to action for everyone. Continue the conversation of environmental justice with family, friends, and coworkers. Um, as you become informed about these issues, talk to people around you and you know, about the importance of these issues, especially those that you're passionate about and want to see change in. Also reach out to organizations and legislators about issues of environmental injustice and environmental racism in your community. So if you've noticed there's some states that were highlighted that maybe 
um, you're from, um, reach out to legislators. They want to hear from constituents. Um, and many of these organiz organizations that support these issues want to talk about them with you and can refer you to other organizations as well. And also advocate for in intersectional environmentalism, which is an inclusive form of environmentalism advocating for the protection of all people on the planet. Um, and so that is all I have for you all. Thank you so much for listening. And I encourage you to continue to speak up on um, issues of social justice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tyler. Really appreciate the infographic, the questions, the call to action. That's what I'm talking about. Thank you. <laughs> Great job. For our final presenter of the night or day or wherever you are, we have Carlos. Let's see if we can see the whole view. Salazar Lemont. Carlos is an artist and curator originally from Caracas, Venezuela. He is currently pursuing his MFA in visual arts at the Sam Fox School of Design and Visual Arts, where he is a Danforth scholar. Before coming to St. Louis, he graduated from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and their dual MA program in arts administration and policy and modern and contemporary art history with the support of the New Artist Society Scholarship. He has participated in local and international ex exhibitions, organizing events and programs with contemporary artists. Uh, oh, that's a lot of artists, such as Luis Caminiti said, I can't pronounce it, Regina Jose Galindo and Carlos Martial, among others. Additionally, he has worked as a community leader and political activist. Salazar Lamont has received artist res residencies and fellowship as an artist, curator, and student, some of which include the Salon Jovenes Con FIA 2.0 slash three prize, uh, student leadership award, and Sachs graduate cur curatorial fellow, among others. Very impressive, Carlos, very impressive, and eager to hear your presentation. Well, thank you. Well, now my presentation has to deliver. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for doing this. Uh, it's an honor to me to be among all of you. Uh, this presentation has been really great. So, well, I'm Carlos Salazar Ramon. I'm a Venezuelan artist and curator. And my pronouns are he, him. And the title of my presentation is Arts and Communities Engage, Culture, Immigration, and Sense of Belonging. Uh, can you all see it? Yes? Okay. Um, okay. So my project, I address intersections between immigration, art and culture, racial inequity, and sense of belonging. I want to talk about this because of two reasons. First, because I'm an immigrant myself. Second, because I believe that immigrants can bring a lot of good to St. Louis. And third, because I am convinced that art and artists are key to foster St. Louis prosperity. But I would like to provide some context first. Um, the last executive administration of the United States presented at an anti-immigration rhetoric when they rose to office. While they claim that they were only against so-called illegal immigrants, uh, the fact is that they were increasing the restrictions to immigrants overall, including those that were doing it legally, adding new steps, increasing fees, and twisting policy interpretations, making it harder for immigrants to come here legally. This means that they were against immigration in general, not only those that came without documents. My opinion is that these policies were against the interests of the American people. For example, St. Louis, I believe that St. Louis needs immigrants. Uh, one of the most popular cities, once one of the most popular cities in the United States, St. Louis has lost 64% of the population it had in the 1950s. This has had an impact on St. Louis productivity and it's a threat to the well being of the city in the long term. St. Louis is a city with a relatively low immigrant population compared to Chicago, whose population is 18% immigrant, while St. Louis is less than 5%. So there is room to grow in that aspect. St. Louis needs to attract more people to come here and thrive. As an immigrant, I believe that there are many important factors 
that will help immigrants to choose St. Louis as their destination. One of them is a, is a strong sense of belonging, which can be fostered by arts since they emphasize what we have in common and can create signs of identity that can speak to common stories while mark, marking a presence in a space that while appealing to emotions. Art is important because it humanizes policy, which might look too pragmatic to many. Thus, art can create means of empathy, so processes of positive change in a society can take place. For example, uh -huh. the current presidential administration issued a temporary protection status for Venezuelans in the United States. The reason for this is that in the last four years, over 5 million Venezuelans have fled our country, trying to save ourselves from economic demise and political oppression. This number represents near 17% of the whole Venezuelan's total population. This issue gains more relevance when we take into account that almost half a million of these Venezuelans have come to the United States and that almost 12,000 have come to the neighboring state of Illinois which make it the fastest growing Venezuelan community and the fastest growing immigrant community in the state. But once we're here and are provided with means to avoid being deported, there are other challenges that follow. For example, what is the sense of belonging that Venezuelan immigrants feel for their new hometowns and how it can be strengthened? Or what is the perception that the locals have of this community? These are questions that require a systematic study to be answered, but regardless of what the results could be, I believe that artists can take action to positively impact on these issues. In my first semester in the MFA program at the Sam Fox School of Design and Visual Arts, I started a project that sought to appeal to the Venezuelan community's sense of identity, while also raising awareness about the crisis on the Venezuelan human displacement and the non-Venezuelan audiences. This process is the Monumento a la Diaspora Venezolana, which means Monument to the Venezuelan Diaspora in Spanish. This three-dimensional project consists on a bunk bed cut in half by an MDF wall. Well, it's not an MDF wall now, I changed it. But one of the sides of this wall is covered by emergency, emergency blankets, while the other is covered with Venezuelan corn flour packages pasted to it, drawing the silhouette of the bunk bed. The Venezuelan cornflower is used for our main dish, the arepas, and it has become a symbol of our nation. I also use the emergency blankets to give a symbolic body to the Venezuelan massive diaspora that now affects the region. The emergency blanket, an element that has become associated with refugees, refugees, reminds us of the Venezuelan migration crisis, but at the same time acts as a mirror, just as Venezuelans never thought that we would be in this situation, the spectator could be in the future too. The bunk bed is an element related to family intimacy. I use the bunk bed elements to generate questions about the force distancing from the low ones and motherland. Having slept on the bunk bed my entire life before coming to the United States, this object became an expression of my link to our families and to our home. It is presented a split just like the Venezuelan friends and family groups are right now. I, will, I play with the contraposition of absence and the prince and presence, which evocate the positive negative aspects of the separation in real life. When developing this project, I was looking for ways to use this work in a way that could foster connection within my community. That is why I contacted the Association of Venezuelans in Missouri, the AMBO, which is an organization that APMO, sorry, which is an organization that seeks to support the Venezuelan diaspora in the state of Missouri, sharing the Venezuelan culture and very importantly, funding a scholarship for Hispanic students in the state. Together, we had the idea of inviting the Venezuelan community to donate the empty packages of Arena Pan, the most popular brand of arepa corn flour. Thus, they would contribute to the making of the piece. At the same time, using this easily recognizable product, every Venezuelan can see themselves reflected on the sculpture. It becomes a sign of identity. The AMBO also proposed that I use their WhatsApp community group to invite my fellow Venezuelans to, particip to participate and also help to collect many of the empty wrappings at their fundraising events. Through this group, I also connected to the wonderful people of Amazing Cakes, who prepares the best Venezuelan food for takeout. 
they were the ones who gave me most of the wrappings. And I would suggest you follow them on Instagram and contact them if you want to have a very good example of Venezuelan food. <laughs> they are really great and very genuine, by the way. Um, so, wait, two minutes, okay. Um, okay, so this was great because not only I as an immigrant from a community here, which also strengthened my own sense of belonging to the place where I am living right now, but also the Venezuela community gains representation in the cultural field here in St. Louis, which will foster their sense of belonging as well. It's also an opportunity for these organizations and businesses to gain visibility. Allow me to remind that the Venezuelan case is just a sample for something that could be larger and more, uh, and more emphatic, which is the way St. Louis funds and promotes cultural initiatives that can make itself more attractive to immigrants. And not only foreign immigrants, since some studies show that their um, art translates into 2.8 times, whoops, oops, sorry a stronger sense of belonging. For example, this one is the Angus Wright Institute brought to us by the Community Foundation of Canada. So an invitation is for all of us to support the funding and fostering of cultural initiatives in St. Louis, especially those that seek to strengthen the sense of belonging communities and to understand the value that art has for our society and the future of Illinois. Thank you so much. There's a round of applause to all of our presenters, Carlos. Great job, great job. Uh, before we moved into our Q&A session, I just really wanted to, again, thank all of our presenters for, for everything that they did today, basically blowing our minds with all of that information. Um, and I also want to formally introduce our Q&A moderator, Becca Smith Grantham. Uh, one more round of applause to our presenters and Again, feel free to put in your questions in the chat. Uh, if there's any burning desires you have right now, just think, think, think about it, type it up, and Becca will get to it. I was going to say, I haven't done something like this before, so we'll have to kind of see where that goes. I've been kind of keeping track, and I haven't seen a lot of questions coming through the chat. And so hopefully, you know, kind of as we're, di we're dialoguing here, we'll be able to come up with something. Um, is there anybody that would like to start us off something specific they were holding on to? I, I, you know, I'm going to start off with a question for, and I'm posing it to everyone, all the presenters here. When you first began the topic for, that you presented on, was that your first topic, like your first choice? Did, did you have another one that you thought of in your head? Like maybe, um, was this already a passionate, passionate interest that you had previously? Well, since I have the microphone open still, uh, I think that in my case it, it was um, because uh, it's something that affects me um, directly uh, and also, uh, as an artist, it's an interest that I have been uh, carrying on with my work. And, and what I did was like trying to take my work towards a more active role in society. Uh, so it, it wasn't too hard to, to choose it in my case. It was more like about like trying to figure out a way to do it. Yeah, for me too, it wasn't hard for me to choose a topic because I have been advocating for like gender and gender equality and gender-based violence prevention for some time now with Care International. So it was so easy for me to decide on what topic to write about. I had two in mind, say from the Start Act and then the VAWA, and then I ended up choosing the VAWA. I can, I can jump in too briefly. I mean, I, I definitely have had a longstanding focus on public schools um, and a general awareness of the teacher shortage, but I, I think there were some eye-opening statistics here. And I guess for my part, like I've, I've sort of 
come to the teacher shortage as like slightly more of a focus of, of my advocacy for public schools, just because for the amount of time I spent in schools, I definitely considered teaching. And I sometimes say like, I'm not enough of a martyr for that because teachers are still just so dramatically like underpaid and overworked from, from what I've witnessed. Um, that I think this sort of lane of advocacy for, for just sort of um, addressing the teacher shortage, which is a much bigger crisis than I originally realized, um, sort of came together with this presentation. I know Tyler had some call to actions with his presentation. What is one thing you want everyone to take away from the work that you've done? What is that call to action that is really something you want to leave with everyone that's watching today? Okay, that's a great question. Um, and then to follow up on the, the earlier question too, um, this work is, I feel like it has been more recent in development and it's something that in, was inspired from my TA experience um, with one of the professors in the built environment class. Um, and then I guess in terms of the call to action, something I want you to take from it is that uh, legislators are willing to hear from you and organizations. And at first it felt like there was like a distant, you know, separation between us and people that are working on the policy level. But honestly, what I discovered is that policy makers aren't experts in every area. And we all have our area of interest that we're really passionate about. And they want to learn about you know, these, these different salient areas, um, especially as it relates to some of the other issues that they're advocating for as well. So reaching, reach out and try to get a hold of these different legislators because they wanna hear from constituents um, and you can make a difference, um, even though it may take some pushing and you know, some repetitive reaching out to you, but honestly reach out and you know, stay, stay active, stay vocal about these issues. And I think one idea that was that was kind of presented as a question is we've kind of looked at how sort of ambitious the first few months of the Biden administration has been. So when you think about the, the policies that we talked about and looked at today, has anything that they've been focusing on initially in the administration been relevant to your work? Right. Okay, while we're thinking about that one, I had a question for Joe. So Joe, as we're, we're going back to the very beginning. I think Kate has something to say about okay, it. Okay, do it, do it. <laughs> um, so yeah, just thinking about um, how systems of healthcare within the United States respond to mental health crisis, um, I think is obviously incredibly relevant uh, as we continue to see the manifestations of um, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I think um, there's some early, early data that's suggesting that um, folks are reporting three times as much depressive symptoms throughout the entirety of the country. Um, and I've, I've kind of conceptualized some of the way in which the Biden administration is trying to respond to this pandemic as, I mean, obviously, personally, I haven't explicitly seen um, ways in which to directly address um, mental health crises. However, I think um, reframing our conception of what that looks like is important. So understanding that like adequate um, pay and increasing minimum wage is um, a mental health treatment and intervention, um, providing child care is a mental health intervention, providing access to education is a mental health intervention. Um, and I think some of, well, obviously like psychiatric protection isn't, isn't being addressed right now. Um, and I think, you know, people are going to disproportionately be prescribed antidepressants and um, be in a decreased mental state and potentially not be able to give adequate informed consent. Um, but I think it, for me, it's felt important to reframe understanding of what kind of tangible and explicit um, behavioral health policy looks like. Thank you, everyone. Um, as we're closing up, if you have any last comments you want to share um, before we're done, thank you, everyone, for all the hard work and all everyone that's attended to listen to these amazing, incredible presenters, leaders of the future and leaders of now, for real. Uh, I'm grateful. <laughs>
Uh, any last comments? Well, if you're interested in graduate policy scholars, I, for anyone who's going to be here in the fall, the application comes out in the fall. So get see that in your inbox, get ready. Uh, also, Dan and Atia, if you don't mind sharing your emails, if anyone wants to get in contact, as well as any presenters, if you don't mind sharing your email in the chat box for anyone who would like to get in contact with you regarding your presentation and your work. Hey, while, while we do this, I would like to thank some people that helped me make this project possible, uh, starting by my advisor uh, for this project, Lisa Bolaski, uh, Liz Kramer from the Office of Community Engagement, uh, my classmates, Quinn Briseño, Karina Rola Gutierrez, and Martin Lamer, who helped me building that huge sculpture. Um, and special thanks to Carly Langloas, who helped me like taking pictures and taking me to faraway places to pick up the Arnida Pan. And also, I want to thank you for like Atia, Dan, General, for your amazing uh, wisdom and guidance during this process. That was really, really helpful and very meaningful to me. And thank you, Angelica, for doing this. And everyone else at the Graduate Policy Scholar Program, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Carlos, for that. I appreciate everyone for attending tonight, today, whatever time it is where you are at. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your week and take with you all these amazing presentations. Feel free to share on YouTube. Oh, <laughs>